God's word for today from Mark, the Gospel of Mark in chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away, sad, because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples are even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. This is the gospel of the Lord. How many of you, raise your hand, how many of you have been involved in a garage sale as the seller, not the buyer, but as the seller? Organized a garage sale, helped, been part of it. I, we're, we're like almost 100% here. Me too. Um, multiple times maybe. I believe I've... I've organized four garage sales on my own and helped organize with others two more. So I'm like you, I'm, I'm a pro at garage sales. Except this, I don't administer garage sales like I used to. I've changed. I think for the better. I remember after my second garage sale, and what's the point of a garage sale? To make money. Well, that was... That's why I did it the first two times. And then I remember the second garage sale, I, I really, I, I mean, I maybe made 30 bucks. I was thinking I was gonna, you know, come, come back with $3,000, and I think I made 30 bucks, and I still had all my junk. And I'm just, I'm just like, what, what's the purpose? What's wrong? And th- this, this thought came to me, this voice, right? This thought, it just said, you know, you still have all this stuff. You still own all this stuff, but not really. It's really the stuff that owns you. Since then, why do I have garage sales? To get rid of stuff. Not to make money, right? To get rid of stuff. Um, How is it that our stuff ends up owning us instead of us owning our stuff? How does that happen? Because our possessions like to possess us. And because we like them. And because we think that we can believe the lies of our stuff that say, if you have enough stuff and and if you have us, we can give you what even God can't give you. And we believe it. How do you know this is happening? How do you know that instead of owning your stuff, your stuff owns you? Let me give you some signs. Here's some symptoms of, of that happening. Uh, you, have, you hold a garage sale and, and you don't sell anything. That's a sign. Uh, living paycheck to paycheck is a sign. Having things and holding privileges that you don't use because you're so busy earning an income to pay for them is a sign. Right? We're, that we tend to try to make a living instead of live a life. And making a living gets in the way of living a life. Uh, I would say this is a sign, I love this one, that, that, right? When, when, when I hear from people 
uh, I don't go to church anymore because the church asked me for money. I believe that's a sign. You, I'm sorry, your, your stuff owns you then. This is this a sign of materialism and greed? Because Jesus asked, as a matter of fact, Jesus asked for more than your money. And actually the church, if we're doing it right, is asking more for more than your money too. We're not asking for just your money. We're asking for all of you. Jesus asked for all of you. So if you're resistant to that, it, the problem isn't with Jesus and the church. That's reality. So if there's something in you that likes to grumble when, uh, when the church asks for money, um, I, I think your stuff owns you more than you owning it. Um, needing more storage space for the same stuff that's already in our storage space, but we have so much of that same stuff that we need more storage space for some of the same stuff that we already have. Right? Those are, all, those are all signs of this. So, when money and possessions own us, they direct our priorities, they determine our path in life, and they actually like to play God. That they are a replacement for our Savior. And that was the problem of this man who approached Jesus. Listen to the false God talking as he approaches Jesus. This is Mark chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him, Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. He, right, right away, it's almost like Jesus is being rude. It's like, wow, he called you good, Jesus, and now you're firing back at him because Jesus doesn't want to be a good teacher. Not the way this man is presenting it. See, this man is coming to Jesus, not needing Jesus as his Savior, He's needing Jesus as his teacher. You know, Jesus, if you just teach me a few things, teach me how to do things, then I'll do them. And hey, I'm good on my own, man. You just tell me what to do, and I can do it. Right? This man is self-sufficient. So he don't, his self-sufficiency doesn't need Jesus to be a savior, just a teacher. He doesn't want Jesus to be his Lord, because his wealth is his Lord. He doesn't want Jesus to lead he wants to be the leader. So in his love for this man, Jesus says, I'm not the good teacher you're looking for. And he refuses to be the good teacher. That's why he rebukes him this way. So Jesus loved this man enough to expose his idolatry. It's like, and Jesus does that to us. He, Jesus roots the idols. He uproots them out of our heart and it hurts. It is like pulling the blankie away from a two-year-old and saying they can't have it, right? You're going to get a temper tantrum when it happens. And Jesus is doing this to this man, and he does it to us. Um, and did you catch that? He's doing it out of love. Verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, Jesus said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away, sad, because he had great wealth. Following Jesus is not complicated. It is so not complicated that Jesus boils it down to one thing, he says. Right? That's what he says to this man, to us. He says, there's just one thing that's getting in the way. Just one. Not 18, not 12. Not just, just one. There's one thing in the way of you having a better prayer life. There's one thing getting in the way of you being more consistent in your gentleness and your kindness and your love for others. There's just one thing getting in the way of you, of you giving more and loving more and, and, and studying God's word more. There's one thing getting in the way of you, Jesus says, following more closely. There's just one thing getting in the way of you being a better spouse and a better friend. There's just one thing getting in the way of you being able to make commitments with courage there's just one thing in the way. What is it? What's Jesus? One thing. He says, you're, there's one thing you lack. And, and we see it when the man walks away. Right? Jesus says, sell it all, get rid of it. Then come follow me. And he couldn't do it. He says, he went away sad because he had a great wealth. You're rich, but you're sad. So what good are the riches? 
you're rich, but you walk away from Jesus. So what good are the riches? And the Bible says because he had great wealth is a summary statement, but really it's not because he owned the wealth, but it's because the wealth owned him. And he walked away from Jesus. What's the one thing? It's not wealth. Wealth, Abraham was wealthy, and he's, the Bible holds him up as a, an example of faith, and he's in heaven already. Wealth is not the one thing that gets in the way. Lots of possessions, not the, not the one thing. The one thing, wealth isn't this man's problem. It's his view of wealth that's his problem. See, so my, a person's own view of wealth, that's the one thing. In other words, my biggest problem, my, the thing that gets in the way, is me. His biggest problem, what was getting in the way, wasn't his wealth, but it was him. It's his view of wealth. How he saw wealth, how he saw Jesus, that's, what's, that's what gets in your way and in mine. That's why Jesus says, it's hard for people to get into the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, it's, not, it's, not, it's impossible. So, uh, this man was, was willing to grab onto all this stuff, and by doing so, he was willing to let go of Jesus. Right? Je I, I want to take all that other stuff, Jesus. I, I, don't, I don't want you. I just want you to be my teacher. So, Jesus, I'm going to have all this other stuff, and it's going to be in the passenger seat with me, and Jesus, you just get in the back seat, okay? I mean, I, I'm going to love all this stuff, Jesus, and I, I promise I'll have a love affair with you, but, but my first love is this stuff. And Jesus says, I'm not... I'm not doing that. I'm not getting in the back seat in, in your ride of life. I will not go with you. And Jesus says, if you don't want me to be your savior, then for you I am nothing at all. That's the one thing. That's, it's not complicated. How hard it is, Jesus says, uh, verse 23, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Whoa. Jesus continues, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Jesus uses this little parable. Because during Jesus' day, what was considered one of the largest known animals was the camel. Right? With the internet and encyclopedias today, we might say elephant or whale. But during Jesus' day, people were generally familiar with the camel as the largest of creatures that he could offer. And the smallest of openings was the eye of a needle. Right? They had needles in Jesus' day, maybe a little more rougher looking than our needles, but they had the same concept. They had a little eye in them where you put, put the thread in. And so this, this, is, this is what Jesus is saying. It's, it's harder for a rich person to, to get into heaven than for that biggest creature that we know to go through that smallest opening, the eye of a needle. That tells me something. That tells me that the problem with me being closer to Jesus and being in the kingdom of God than the problem with me is the problem that I'm too big. And not just physically. I know I'm a huge guy. Um, but, uh, you know, you're, I know you're saying, wow, you know, I, but it, it's not just, it's not actually not that at all, right? It's my view of myself compared to you, compared to others, compared to life, compared to Jesus himself. This man thought he was bigger than Jesus. He says, Jesus, I'm driving. You're, you're in the back seat. Jesus says, you're too big in your own eyes. And I'm too, right? I'm too small for you. You're, you got it mixed up. So we're too big, we, our arms are loaded with so many things, so much stuff, there's no way we could make it through the eye of a needle. Jesus says, you're too big! How big is Jesus? Kids, 
How big is Jesus? How big is God? Is God like this big? As big as a person or is he bigger? Is God as big as a mountain? Wow. God made the mountains. God's even bigger than the mountains. All of them, all the mountains put together, stacked on top of each other. Jesus, God is bigger than that. The, the, the Bible says that God is everywhere that there is a place. God holds the entire existence, whatever exists on this planet and in our universe and beyond. God embraces it. He's bigger than it. Jesus is God. Jesus is bigger than all of it. Jesus is the biggest of anything or anyone that we could... He's bigger than our problems. He's bigger than our sins. He's bigger than everything. But he went through the eye of the needle. Jesus did for us what he says we can never do on our own. Jesus became small. And that's the one thing that saves us from our one thing. Very literally and physically, Jesus became an embryo. I'm doing this because embryos are really small, I guess. <laughs> right? He became so small you can't see it with the naked eye. He became, and then he was born, little baby. That's a lot bigger than an embryo, but not just physically, but, right? Spiritually, Jesus became small. He humbled himself from being a God in eternal paradise and ruling over all creation to, to not using his divine powers like he could in suffering and dying and, and experiencing the most excruciating death that they could think of at that time, and that was crucifixion. That's becoming small. Insignificant. He didn't announce his first coming with trumpets. It was just a bunch of dirty, lowly shepherds around and a, a, a poor teenage couple that couldn't even afford the common sacrifices. That's, see that? Jesus became small, so small he could fit through the eye of the needle. So, this man was willing to let Jesus go. Jesus plead for you is to not let him go. Be willing to let everything else go. Let your stuff go. If necessary, let your job go. Let your friendships go. None of it is more important than Jesus because none of it can do for you what Jesus can do. Forgive your sins and give you salvation, eternal life. So how do you do that? How do you hold on to Jesus so tightly? How do you grab onto him so that you never let him go? How do you do that? Here's his answer. Believe that I never let you go. We read this in Hebrews 13 earlier. I love this verse. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you Never will I forsake you. Do you know that uh, Google, the company Google, they say is one of the most, the, one of the funnest places to work? It's a very innovative, very creative company. They, they're all over the place. I mean, they have, for their employees, they have pool tables, bowling alleys, free food, free gym memberships. Uh, one of the perks or, or innovations that Google uses is actually announced by a letter, uh, uh, in a letter by their founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, in uh, 2004 in their IPO letter. Right? Here's what they wrote about one particular innovation if you're working at Google. Listen to this. These are the owners now, right? Uh, we encourage our employees, in addition to their regular projects, to spend 20% of their time working on what they think will most benefit Google. This empowers them to be more creative and innovative. Many of our significant advances have happened in this manner. But that, so they're saying, take 20% of, of your work time and just do something fun. Like, go bowling. Get, get, get out of here, work out, count it as work time. Check on your fantasy football league. Watch the World Series. 
do something that really juices you and it makes you innovative and creative. And uh, that's, that's the 20% rule at Google. Now, some have said that's a bit more legendary than realistic. And actually, when interviewed, uh, Google admits that very few employees use the 20% rule. They actually said less than 5% of employees use the 20% rule. You can put those two together. Um, well, you go into why that doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen as much. Uh, Yahoo CEO and former Googler, Marissa Mayer, once bluntly denied the existence of Google's 20% rule altogether. She said this, it's funny, people have been asking me since I got to Yahoo, she formerly worked at Google, when is Yahoo going to have the 20% time? I've got to tell you the dirty little secret of Google's 20% time. It's really 120% time. Ah. So in other words, Google isn't willing to let you take a piece of the pie of your time with them. They, they actually think, say that, but you, you have to stack that on top of all your time. You have to give them 100% and put the 20% on top of that. She's saying, this is not as free and creative and fun and, and innovative as it sounds, this is burdensome. This is duty, not delight. It's really not free, really not fun. See that word free in Hebrews 13? Free. This is more than a 20% rule that, that God has for us. God gave us not 50% of his son Jesus, not the right side of his body crucified. He gave us all of Jesus, all of his son, all of his sacrifice for all of our sins. 100% entirely a gift to us, Jesus is. And so we don't have to stack 20% on top of our 100% because we have that and now we're free. Free to let go of everything else. Free to, to be daring and courageous in our faith and to trust Jesus when he says, come follow me, but let that go first. That's not duty. For the trusting disciple of Jesus who knows his love, that's delight. Did you catch the first few words? Here's another thing I like to teach, and I, I need to teach us more. Like when, when, we start re when you start reading the Bible at home, or there's transitions between stories and the Gospels. Or even I start with a Bible reading here. Sometimes we skip over the first few words. They say things like, therefore, or then, or consequently, or from that place. Those transitions are very key sometimes to understanding the depth of what we're reading. So pay attention to the transition words. The transition words here that we read here in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, the first words in verse 17 say, as Jesus started on his way. Jesus is on his way. Guess where he's going? Yeah, he's going to Jerusalem. And guess what's going to happen there? He says it later, actually, in Mark 10. Right? He's, he's going to be handed over by sinful men. They're going to, in injustice, they're going to crucify him. He's going to die. And then he's going to rise again. And don't you, you, you read the Gospels and you get a sense of Jesus, not of duty, not of grumbling and complaining, not of, ah, oh, Father, I am wide, and grumbling about his followers, about you, about me, but you get this sense of delight, of freedom, of contentment with the Father's will for him. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he asks if there's another way, and there isn't, you see, he's not grumbling and complaining, he's not resisting. He's not being dragged by the Spirit with his heels digging into the dirt, making a path, right? Jesus has a sense of freedom and delight and contentment in the Father's plan. He is on his way right here and now to do it all. Are you willing to classify yourself as rich? I, as Americans, it's pretty easy targets when I, when I say that you're rich. As a matter of fact, this, just this year, 2018, a study, study has been done because uh, right, global wealth distribution is really an issue. So you study the numbers. Here's, this, here's the threshold. 
To be in the top 1% of the world's wealthiest people, you ready for this? Your, your income for the year needs to be, what did he guess, six figures? Smaller. Smaller than 50. The, 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 the study that I read said top 1%, your, your annual income is $32,400. <clears throat> compared globally to all the other countries, all the other people, everywhere, right? You are top 1% of the wealthiest people in the world if your annual income is $32,400. That's most of us adults and maybe even some recent graduates, right? Um, or a kid, if you have a really good paper route, you won't allow lots. Uh, or rich. Let's just stop pretending we're not, we are. But here's the question. It's not how rich you are, but how you are rich. The question isn't if I have enough stuff. The question is, what am I doing with it? The question isn't, does Jesus love me and, and does he give me his, his everything? That's, that's slam dunk real. The question is, what am I doing with it? Am I, I going to hold on to everything else and let Jesus go like this man did? Am I going to go away sad because I'm, I'm caught up in my wealth and it owns me? Here's, here's the answer. Instead of your stuff owning you, live the rest of your life knowing, believing, and living that Jesus and his riches own you more than any of your stuff ever could. And when they own you, when Jesus and his rich promises and the ultimate destiny that he has for you in heaven and the, and the grand, meaningful purpose that he gives to you, like he wanted to give this man, come follow me. When that owns you, oh, that makes, that makes the biggest difference. Instead of fear, and anxiety, there's freedom and enjoyment. Instead of stinginess and, and, and our knuckles white from grabbing onto things, there's joyful generosity and, and a new place in life. All because Jesus himself follows the 120% rule. More than enough for us. He's calling, you know. Today, in these words, he's calling you. Come, follow me. He's given you, he's given us as a, as a church. He's given you enough to do that and to do it well. So trust him, obey him, live for him, follow him. Because you already have great wealth. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today, for your words that are so clear. You bring us into these stories in a dramatic and a real way. And we discover as we read your word and study it that we are these people. And that we're just not very different than people of other cultures and than each other because our, our hearts are our hearts and people are people. So Jesus, we confess today that we're like this man and that we're owned by our stuff, but we're so thankful that you look at us and you love us like you loved him. And you're patient with us, and day after day you uproot our idols with the hope and the dream that, that you fill more of our heart than we're willing to let you do. In your mercy, Jesus, and in your riches, we know that you take care of that by not letting us go. Oh, help us to have so much joy in what you do for us. So much more delight in our Christian life than duty. And for people to see that in us so that they know through us that you give them everything too. May these words today, Jesus, change our week, change our lives, change our eternity. In your name we pray. Amen.